We live in a world at war. The enemy of our souls is out to win a particular battle. He's begun a rebellion. But sometimes as Christians, we don't realize that we're in a war. And I would suggest that sometimes, because we don't realize we're in this war, sometimes we end up actually fighting inadvertently for the other side. Today I want to talk to you about something that we do in the 21st century Canadian Christian Church. We do it every day. It's sinful, it's wrong, but it's become such a part of our culture that for us it's like breathing. We just do it without even knowing it. The good news is that the Holy Spirit can show us what we're doing and can walk us into a place where He gives us the strength to battle this evil in our hearts. What am I talking about? Well, to learn more about this sin that has so influenced us in our modern church, let's just open our Bibles and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 14. And we're continuing along in this series called A Passion for His Presence on the Life of David. And uh, this chapter begins by saying, Joab, son of Zeruah, knew that the king's heart longed for Absalom. Now let's just back up and get a little bit of the context here. In the previous chapter, King David's eldest son Amnon... You'll probably remember a couple of weeks ago we saw he raped his own half-sister Tamar. And then after planning it for a couple of years, the next eldest son, Absalom, killed Amnon for it. Probably a couple of reasons for this. One of it was to avenge the rape of his sister. But secondly, we see that Absalom then became David's eldest son and he now was in line for the kingship. Two weeks ago, we left off at the end of the chapter where Absalom has killed Amnon, and then he flees up north to hang out with his maternal grandfather, who is the king of a territory up there called Geshur. David's army commander, his nephew Joab, the son of David's sister Zeruah, Joab knows that David is thinking about his son who lives up north now, and Joab devises a clever way to bring back Absalom and get David to approve that. In the next few verses of chapter 14, we find that Joab ser- uh, finds the services of a wise woman. And uh, he sends this woman to David and puts certain words in her mouth to say. Like the prophet Nathan in chapter 12, uh, the woman pretends to be asking David about a judicial matter. She's seeking justice. But in fact, she's made up a story that she's using to try to convince David to bring Absalom back and end his banishment. And you can read about how she goes about that. It's clever in verses 2 to 22. But to to suffice it for today to say she succeeds. David orders that Absalom can come back from up north in Geshur. In verse 23 it says, Then Joab went to Geshur and brought Absalom back to Jerusalem. Now we may wonder here, why does Joab want Absalom back? Is he just a nice guy? Does he just like uh, Absalom's company? Is it because Joab is sick of seeing David and Absalom not being reunited? Well, I don't think so. In his role as David's chief general, Joab does not strike me as a man who is driven by sentimentality. He's always thinking in strategic terms. Joab is always thinking about the security of the nation. That's his job. And Joab will even disregard the king's commands if he thinks it will enhance the security of David's kingdom. That's why David brokered a peace treaty with Abner, but Joab killed him anyhow. David later on told Joab to just kill Uriah in battle, but Joab knew that that would not be good and would lead to suspicion. Joab oversaw the killing of a bunch of guys to make the cover-up more convincing. Over and over, Joab is portrayed as a man who's ruthless and will do anything to make David's kingdom more secure, even disobeying his uncle, King David. And so my suspicions here for why he wants Absalom back in Jerusalem is that this has nothing to do with sentimentality. It's not that he loves and cares for Absalom. I believe he wants Absalom to be closer to home so his activities can be more closely monitored. Joab does not want Absalom up in enemy territory, maybe building a foreign army with his grandfather, the king of Geshur. And so in my opinion, Joab cleverly is looking at this from a security standpoint. He's not interested in facilitating a reunion between David and his son. And we'll see see that later. 
But and that's probably why the reunion then doesn't really happen immediately. Because it says in the next verse, after Joab brings Absalom back to Jerusalem, David says, he must go to his own house. He must not see my face. And it says that Absalom went to his own house and did not see the face of the king. It says the two years go by and still Absalom has not met with his dad. On the one hand, he's being punished for what he did to his brother. But on the other hand, he's really... Sorry, on the one hand, he's not really been punished. He hasn't been punished for killing his brother. But on the other hand, he's not yet been reinstated with the rights and privileges of sonship. And so this young man is living in limbo with very little opportunity and not a lot to do, which is kind of a dangerous combination. Finally, Absalom, Absalom is tired of waiting for his dad to reinstate him, and so he takes matters into his own hands. Verse 28, then Absalom sent for Joab in order to send him to the king, but Joab refused to come to him, so he sent him a second time, this, please come and help me, and no, Joab refused to come. So you can see that Joab has very little interest in creating a reunion between David and his son. As long as Absalom is close at hand and he's not creating trouble and building a foreign army up north, then Joab is happy. But Absalom is not happy being ignored. And so he says to his servants, look, Joab's field is next to, next to mine and he has barley growing there. Go set it on fire. So this ripe barley is set on fire. Now there's a question that I think we have to pause and ask here. And the question simply is this. Is this a smart thing? to tick off Joab? Is this a good idea? Because if we, as we have already seen again and again, Joab is one ruthless, mean dude. He stabbed Abner in the stomach, sacrificed a bunch of his own soldiers to cover up for Uriah's murder. The greatest commander militarily that Israel has ever seen, a brilliant tactician, a brilliant genius politically, a case can be made that Joab exerts more control and influence in the nation than the king himself. With all that in mind, is it wise to tick off this guy? I don't think so. And one day, young Absalom will find himself hanging from the branch of a tree, his feet swinging in the air, with Joab approaching with three spears in his hand. And Absalom will regret in that moment that he made an enemy out of his older first cousin. But we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Back here in the story, after torching Joab's crops, Absalom stares down the most fearless soldier in Israelite history and demands that he see his father. And the chapter ends by saying, So Joab went to the king and told him this. Then the king summoned Absalom. He came in and bowed down with his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. Now, we're going to pause right now then and just explore what does the Bible say at this point in the story about what Absalom is like? What kind of a man is he? Because during the two-year period while he's waiting to be reinstated, the Bible tells us what he was doing. It says, in all Israel, there was not a man so highly praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. From the top of his head to the sole of his foot, there was no blemish in him. So he's a very good looking man, which is nice, but is he one of these pretty boys who's always, you know, in the, you know, in the, primping and, well, we kind of get a bit of a hint of this in the next verse where it says, whenever he cut the hair of his head, he used to cut his hair once a year because it became too heavy for him. He would weigh it and its weight was 200 shekels. Now we have to ask, who on earth would weigh their hair, right? What would you think of someone who makes a big hairy deal out of an annual haircut by weighing and then publishing abroad the weight of his hair? One of my favorite biblical commentators puts it this way. I love this line. Weighing one's hair, even among narcissists, must be an anomaly. He's not only the crown prince in waiting, He's the, wait for it, heir apparent. You're welcome. He's the main attraction. I could do this all day, ladies and gentlemen. I know, I know you love it. I look for a picture online that would kind of help us to understand what does five pounds of hair look like? I found this. I think she needed like five pounds of weaves to pull that off. So, The Bible goes on to say, three sons and a daughter were born to Absalom. 
His daughter's name was Tamar, and she became a beautiful woman. And so he's busy during this two-year waiting period reproducing himself. And we learn actually later that all of these three sons die in childhood. Must have been a tremendous source of pain to Absalom and to his wife. We learn in 2 Samuel 18 that Absalom had this massive monument that was built to his own glory. And he said, they did this because there's no son remaining to carry on my name. Absalom's daughter is named Tamar, which is interesting. Notice the name. He names her after his sister who was abused by Amnon. And I think this is probably what appeared to me that Absalom has an interest in keeping the name of Tamar in front of people. A perpetual reminder of Amnon's sin. A perpetual reminder of the justification for his brother's murder. But that's just my, my opinion. But we find that as we're waiting here for Absalom to be reinstated as the crown prince, he's described, what, as handsome, praised by everyone for his looks, not a blemish, and hosting an annual hair-weighing ritual, making babies. He's coming off as the People magazine's sexiest man alive. The 990 BC edition, that is. Not a bad life, if I do say so myself. But it gets better, because after meeting with David at the end of chapter 14, in the next chapter it says, in the course of time, Absalom provided himself with a chariot and horses, and get this, 50, no less than 50 men to run ahead of him down the street. Now, the character zone of Absalom is beginning to come into sharper focus here. In addition to having lovely looks and luxurious locks of biblical proportions, an unhealthy and excessive interest in his outward appearance, this guy is cultivating an aura of impressive importance. He's got a substantial entourage of 50 guys and an incredible motorcade. Can you picture this? Picture this, five pounds of his plentiful hair flowing in the wind. Absalom sits high on his chariot and drives his magnificent steed. David has only got 30 mighty men. Absalom has 50 dudes ahead of him declaring that the great and mighty Absalom is about to turn the corner. Bow before his imminency. My friends, this is not what God had in mind when he gave rules and regulations for kingship in Deuteronomy chapter 17. This is the opposite of what God wants from his king. Not unlike the Kardashians or Paris Hilton, Absalom is a socialite. He's famous for being famous. Spending daddy's money on sweet, tricked out rides and cool crowds. He's the original trust fund baby. But that doesn't mean he's without ambition, folks. The next verses tell us Absalom is incredibly busy making a name for himself and making himself popular with the common people. It says he would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. Now, Absalom is not sleeping in. No, he goes to that place, the courtroom of their society. This is the place of the law court. This is the city gate. And something we'll find is that there is no representative for the king who is there to rule on the court cases that are coming in from out of town. And into that place of vacuum steps Absalom. It says, whenever someone came with a complaint to be placed before the king for decision, Absalom would take the initiative and call out to him, what town are you from? He would answer, your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say, look, your claims are valid and proper, but uh, there's just no representative of the king to hear you. What is Absalom doing here? Instead of going to his father and saying, Dad, did you realize there's a whole bunch of people coming in from out of town to the law court, the city gate, and no representative there to process their claims? No, instead of running to his father and explaining the breakdown in the legal system, no, Absalom is secretly undermining his dad's authority, sympathizing with their frustration. And instead of taking these people to his dad, it says, and Absalom would add, if only I were appointed judge in the land. Then everyone who has a complaint or a case could come to me, and I would see that they get justice. Now, actually, the words at the end of that sentence are more accurately rendered, and I would see that they're declared righteous. In other words, 
Absalom is promising the moon. He's saying, anybody who comes to me, and I would declare you in the right. That's not very good judicial process, is it? But, I mean, like many a politician before and after him, he's promising more than he can deliver. Cunningly, he's undermining and offering himself as a substitute for his incapable father. Now, wait, there's more. It says also, whenever anyone approached him to bow down, Absalom would, so no, no, he would reach out his hand, he would take a hold of him, lift him up and kiss him. In other words, he's saying, I'm on your level. Oh, come on, don't bow to me. No, 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 no. He gives him a hug and he gives them a kiss. And it says, Absalom behaved in this way toward all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice. And so he stole the hearts of the people of Israel from his father. Absalom is smart and sneaky enough not to ask to be made king, but to publicly question the inactivity of his superiors, to audibly wish that he were in a position to help them, to confidently promise that he could give them the moon, and then cleverly fooling them into thinking, only I care. Once Absalom is confident that he has built up over time enough support for his kingship in the land, he, he sets a trap for his dad says in verse 7, at the end of four years, Absalom said to his dad, the king, let me go to Hebron and fulfill a vow I made to the Lord. So he makes up a phony religious oper- uh, you know, excuse to go to Hebron to begin a coup, a rebellion from there. Why would Hebron be the place to start this coup d'etat? Well, it's a religiously political politically significant city. Remember, this is where David was appointed king of Judah in chapter 2. The second reason is because it's a bit of a distance from Jerusalem, so David's not going to be able to squash the coup very quickly. And another reason is because this used to be the center of power in the kingdom, and therefore there were a number of people who are still upset that the power, the religious and political power has been shifted from their hometown to Jerusalem. So there's going to be some, a support base there for Absalom. And the Bible says that Absalom successfully convinces his father to lift his travel restrictions. And so it says that the king said to him in verse 9, go in peace. Which is ironic because he's going to rebel and to start a coup. But we see here that these are the last words that David speaks to his son. This section of the story ends by describing Absalom's plot for revolt. Then Absalom sent secret messengers throughout the tribes of Israel to say, as soon as you hear the sound of trumpets, say, Absalom is king in Hebron. And so this is very well planned out. It's very well thought through. Secret messengers infiltrating the whole country. Do you remember those who came seeking justice and heard Absalom and was treated as an equal? These are the folks that are about to say at the same time from every corner, David will hear and surround sound the words, Absalom is king. But something else Absalom does is genius. It says 200 men from Jerusalem accompanied Absalom. They had been invited as guests and went quite innocently, knowing nothing about the matter. And so there are 200 probably very influential people in the kingdom. They don't know anything about this rebellion, but David doesn't know that. And so Absalom brilliantly conveys the illusion that he has a lot more support than he really does. I would suggest the next thing that Absalom does, though, is the game changer. How often have you seen with, you know, the addition of the right running mate will give a big boost to a politician, right? Well, in the same way, Absalom adds a supporter in the next verse here that ensures that his rebellion will gain great traction. It says, while Absalom was offering sacrifices, he sent for Ahithophel, the Gilanite, David's counselor, to come from Gilo his hometown. Who is this Ahithophel? This is David's senior advisor. Later in the story, we'll find out how influential this man was in David's court. In the next chapter, it tells us that in those days, the advice Ahithophel gave was like that of one who inquires of God. That is how David regarded Ahithophel's advice. This addition of Ahithophel to Absalom's rebellion is the TSN turning point of the game. This is a game changer. And for this reason, the Bible now summarizes Absalom's rebellion by saying, and so the conspiracy gained strength and Absalom's following kept on increasing. David is in trouble. I started out this message by saying that there's something 
that Christians are doing in the church in Canada that is devastating. It is a sin that has permeated the very fabric of our society and our lives. We are swimming with the stream of culture on this, and we don't even realize it. Woven into the fabric of how we think is rebellion. We are, let's admit it, a rebellious people. I'm not talking about us particularly, but Christians today in our society, a classic definition is that rebellion is an act of defiance toward an authority. Rebellion can be demonstrated against so many different people. We can rebel against our parents. The Bible says, children, obey your parents. Honor your mother and your father. But because of our original sin, rebellion takes root at an early age. It grows during adolescence. When we go to school, we rebel against teachers. A rebellion grows with every passing year. The teacher's pet is teased. The bad kid gets the laugh. Employers, then, as we grow up, we have uh, employers that must bear the brunt of our rebellion toward our parents and toward our teachers. It spills over and we wonder, why can't I get any traction in my career? How come we're always hitting a brick wall and I can't seem to break in? Well, it's rebellion. It's killing us. We bring rebellion into our marriages and now we have disrespecting our spouse, not obeying their wishes not obeying the scripture that says to husbands and wives, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We have rebellion toward our church leaders, which sounds a little self-serving for me to say it, but we do. A verse in the Bible says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority. I like that part, but then it goes on to say, because they must keep watch over you as those who must give an account to God, which I don't like that part as much. Do this so their work will be a joy, not a burden, that it would be of no benefit to you. We have rebellion against government. The Bible tells us, pay our taxes, obey the laws of the land. Peter says, submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether the emperor or to governors. But this rebellion of authority is ultimately rooted in a rebellion against the one who placed those people over us, and that is God. The Bible says that there is a rebellion that is ongoing, led by Lucifer, the original rebel. Isaiah 14 says of Satan, how you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You've been cast down to earth. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars. I will make myself just like the Most High. We live in a world at war. There is a rebellion, and sadly, we are often fighting on the wrong side. For rebellion finds its genesis in the very heart of Satan himself. A famous statement on the nature of rebellion is actually taken from the very beginning of the, of the Davidic history, where God is speaking through the prophet Samuel to Saul. He says, for rebellion is like the sin of divination or witchcraft and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. God compares our rebellion to the sins of witchcraft and idolatry. They are destructive. And we see how destructive in biblical characters like Absalom as well as those who live in our own society and continue in rebellion. Some of you are asking, well, Steve, isn't there some times when we need to rebel against authority? And the answer is there are times when we do not sit, submit to authority. And the reason is because to obey would be to disobey God. See, if it involves something immoral or, or illegal, then we know we don't submit to leaders like that. And an example is taken from the book of Acts where Peter and John are told, don't tell anyone about Jesus anymore. And they reply, is it right in God's eyes to listen to you or to him? You be the judge, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And so they say, if we are forced between a choice between obeying God and obeying you, we're going to obey God. But that's the only exception. To apply this text then, we, we want to ask ourselves a couple of questions. Let me ask you the question, am I fostering an environment that creates rebellion in the way I lead? Not just me, but you ask that question, and I'll ask that question. Let's all ask. We all have areas in our life where we lead, don't we? And there are some things that we can draw out of this text in terms of how we might foster an environment, unwittingly sometimes even, that encourages rebellion in the way that we lead. For example, we've got David's bad example. There is some evidence in the text that the woman David marries named Ahinoam is in fact the former wife of Saul. 
and the mother of his first wife, Michal. If that is true, if David has married a daughter and a mother, then he has broken Leviticus 18 that says, do not have sexual relations with a woman and her daughter. The weirdness of that attraction may explain in some part the weirdness of their son Amnon, who is attracted to his half-sister. Setting a poor example for those who follow us can foster an environment of rebellion. There's also, we see in David, an abuse of power. And so David has taken a man's wife, he's taken Bathsheba, impregnated her, killed her husband Uriah to cover it up. And this is so callous. The abuse of power fosters an, an environment of rebellion in his kingdom. This is why God says, the sword now will never depart from your house. There's a lack of transparency, for David confesses his sin to Nathan the prophet and to God, but he does not admit his sin to the extent that it's known. See, many people have seen David take Uriah's wife Bathsheba into his harem and impregnate her. They have seen this, and yet they don't know that David has been sorry. Only Nathan knows, and everybody else thinks that he got away with literal murder. And the lack of honesty and transparency and public confession about his sin is fostering, I would suggest, an environment of rebellion. Sin needs to be confessed to the extent that it's known. There's also inactivity and inattention. David does not punish his son Amnon for raping his sister. David does not pursue Absalom for uh, bring justice for killing his brother. For three years, David leaves Absalom up north, only brings him back when Joab convinces him to. David doesn't have his representatives at the gate helping people who come seeking justice. What I'm saying is that David is not doing his job. He's not active in judicial matters. He's not engaged in bringing justice for the oppressed. And it is fostering, in my opinion, an atmosphere, an environment that is conducive to rebellion. And even when he comes home, David doesn't see what's happening to Absalom. He's not attentive to what is going on at the city gate. He doesn't see Absalom's obsession with his looks and with his impressive motorcade and his sizable entourage. That lack of attention to what's going on with his son is fostering, I believe, an environment that is conducive to rebellion. Earlier in the biblical story, God says to Moses, I want you to select capable men from the people who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain. These are the ones that we place in leadership. Leaders are to meet this criteria of being capable. And this David is missing out at this time in his life. He is not capable. And so, I believe, he's creating a greenhouse for rebellion to grow in his own family. There's a lack of relationship and accessibility. David consigns Absalom to house arrest for two years without any communication. No effort made to really restore the relationship. When Absalom wants to get together with his dad, there is no access to him. And then when there is access, there's a perfunctory kiss, but no evidence of an ongoing relationship. And so as we look at these things that foster rebellion, can we ask ourselves, honestly, in the way that we lead, do any of these dynamics come into play? in the way that we lead? Is there a bad example at play? A lack of transparency and confession? Is there the abuse of power? Any inactivity or inattention to the job that God's given us? Is there any lack of relationship or accountability? Of course, there's nothing that you can do to absolutely rebellion-proof your home, your workplace, your classroom, but you can do things that will minimize the opportunity for rebellion. Why did this rebellion take hold, not only in Absalom's heart, but in the whole nation? We have to ask ourselves if David was percolating this with his own behavior. So we have areas where we lead, but we also have areas in our life where we must follow. And so let's ask ourselves the question, am I also creating in any way an attitude of rebellion in my heart in the way that I follow or don't follow? See, often we do things unknowingly. We're like a frog in the kettle of our culture, caught up in just religious, sorry, rebellious attitudes and behavior, we are going down a slippery road of rebellion without sometimes even knowing it we're playing for the other side. So let's start by mentioning Absalom's pride and self-absorption. This is where I tried to talk to you about his legendary hair was his downfall, literally, as he's swinging from the trees a little later on. It's his hair, it's his obsession often that takes us down. It's our pride. It's being absorbed in ourselves. Like the Greek myth 
of Narcissus who fell in love with his own reflection and later drowned. With 50 men running ahead of him, Absalom is way overestimating his importance to the kingdom of God. So let's ask, are we too, maybe too focused on our looks, on the impression that we're making? Are we overly concerned with impressing others rather than serving God? Is there also unchecked ambition? Like his dad, sorry, unlike his dad, Absalom is an early riser. He's motivated, but it's not checked by moral and legal limits. We ought to ask ourselves, are we allowing our ambition to get in the way of our better judgment? Are we convinced that the way to go up is to take others down? Ambition is a good thing, but it must be pursued in the right way. Otherwise, we foster an attitude of rebellion in our heart. There's also inappropriately applied persuasive powers at work here. Absalom has incredible powers of persuasion, but he uses it for evil purposes. He's able to get his followers to kill Amnon. Then he persuades his servants to set Joab's field on fire. He tricks his dad into letting him go to Hebron, convinces the top advisor of the land to join his cause. He has people all over the country declare their loyalty to him at the same time. Absalom is an amazing communicator. Those persuasive powers could have been used for a good purpose, but they're inappropriately applied. He uses them for a manipulative cause. What about us? Are we using flattery and manipulation to steal the hearts of our fellow followers that we might foster a rebellion There's also undermining of leadership. Absalom is doing everything he can to make his dad look bad instead of going to his father and pointing out the weaknesses in the administration and offering to help. Absalom dedicates himself to making himself look good and his dad look bad. He's undermining the authority of his father. What about us? Do we undermine the leadership that God has placed over us by gossiping about them, slandering them, working to make them look bad? Or are we going to them with their shortcomings and helping them to become better leaders? I, can't, I understand we can't always change the toxic nature of an organization, but it would be better for you to look for a different place to work than to undermine the leadership there with underhanded means. One more thing just quickly. There's an unexamined personal pain potentially here. The Bible doesn't make a big point of this, but Absalom had all three of his sons die at a young age intensely painful, and often when personal tragedy befalls us. There can be a vulnerability to rebellion, you see. Sometimes we get angry at God. But as Christians, we don't want to admit to ourselves that we're angry at God, and so who are we going to be angry at? Maybe the people that God has placed over us, those authorities at church or at work or in our own home. Do you you see any of these things in the danger zone for you and the roles where you need to follow? Is there any pride and self-absorption? Is there any unchecked ambition? Any inappropriately applied persuasive powers? Undermining of leadership happening? Are you gossiping and speaking negatively about those over you? Is there unexamined personal pain? My friends, rebellion is like cancer in the body of Christ. It must be rooted out. But how? We must confess our sin to God. God, I admit that I've been rebellious in these ways. Confess it to God in a trusted friend. Repent, turn away from it. Receive God's fresh grace and ask him to help you to live in humility and transparency. The good news is God will forgive us. If we come to him in humble prayer, the Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love, and the scriptures say he forgives sin in our rebellion. Amen. He will forgive you. Come, confess your sins. Through the prophet Jeremiah, God says, I will cleanse them from all sin they have committed against me, and I will forgive all their sin of rebellion against me. Praise God. We can receive grace, and we can walk in humility and transparency. My friends, the world that we live in is absolutely saturated in rebellious attitudes. Even the church is steeped in rebellious ways of thinking and acting. We'll see next, a couple of weeks from now that in Absalom's life, this is a devastating trail that he's on. But the Bible promises that we can change. We can change our ways. In fact, we can be different than the culture that we're living in. And so let me leave you with this verse. It says, do everything without grumbling. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault, in a warped and crooked generation. Let me pray. 
So gracious Heavenly Father, we confess now our sin. We confess that we have rebelled against those people that you have placed over us. We have rebelled, God, against government, our own spouse, our parents, our teachers. We have rebelled, oh God, against church leaders. And we have ultimately, we have rebelled against you, inadvertently even, joining in behaviors that mirror that of the ultimate rebellion of Lucifer himself. And so we pray that you would cleanse us and help us to receive full forgiveness as we confess and repent. We thank you that you are a merciful God and that we can draw near to you. In Jesus' name, we ask for your strength. Amen.